I gave this life of a dream everything I had. And to do that, I gave up martial arts and I gave up acting. And I just kind of said, okay, let's do it and let's see what happens. Hello, everyone, and welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 746, with my guest today, Wesley Chu. I'm Jeremy Lesniak, your host for the show, founder of Whistlekick, where all of the great stuff that we do is in support of the traditional martial arts. We're constantly rolling out new things, updating things, adding things, supporting things, and that's why you should visit whistlekick.com. It's our online home, the place to find out about all these great things that we're working on in support of you and the stuff that you love. So check it out. And one of the things you're going to find over there is our store because, yeah, things cost money. And one of the ways that we cover the expenses for these great projects we're working on is selling stuff. We've got everything from protective equipment to fun apparel, training programs, and so much more. If you find something in the store that you like, please use the code, if you want to, you don't have to, podcast15 to save 15% on the stuff over there. If you want to know more about the show, we've got a separate website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We bring you two episodes each and every week, all under the heading of connecting, educating, and entertaining the traditional martial artists of the world. Now, if our work means something to you, yeah, you could buy something, but there are plenty of other ways that you could help us out. You could tell a friend. It's a great free, quick thing. Share this episode on social media. Let people know, hey, there's a show. You'll like it. Check it out. You could join our Patreon, maybe pick up a book on Amazon, leave a review. That's free. If you're interested in our Patreon, which has a bunch of different tiers and we've got stuff in there so you can actually make it a tax write-off if you're a school owner, patreon.com slash whistlekick. It's as little as two bucks a month and it goes up from there. Check it out, patreon.com slash whistlekick. And if you want the whole list, all the things you can do to help us in our mission, type in whistlekick.com slash family. And here we go with today's episode. With my guest, Wesley Chu. Wes, what's going on? Hey, how's it going? It's going well. Thanks for being here. Yeah. What's going on with that background? So obviously it's the Northern Lights, but why do you have the Northern Lights as your background? Well, you know, it's like, I, I've been full-time writing since 2012. And uh, so for the past like 10 years, I've had the house to myself. Uh-huh. So when the pandemic started, you know, suddenly I went from having the house to myself to like my wife's working at home. I got two young kids and they're six. And like, we just had to like figure out how to make it work in our house, you know. So basically the my study became like my workout room slash the guest bedroom slash everything, everything that didn't fit in every other room. So I, I don't think you need to see like, you know, <laughs> I, get I don't it. think you need to see the slop here. I don't know if you remember, I think it was like a year before the pandemic. There was some guy on, I think it was on CNN and his kid ran into the room while he was on. Right. And I saw that and I was like, oh, that's funny. That's endearing. That's authentic. And there were a lot of people that I heard making kind of judgmental comments. Oh, that's unprofessional, et cetera. And then fast forward a year or two. Now everybody understands. Yeah. Now yeah. everybody gets it. What what's it what it's like to work from home? I've worked from home in various ways for 20 years. It is it is hard to draw those lines, hard to create that separation. Oh, I mean, absolutely, especially have little kids. I mean, mm. I, I remember like early in the pandemic, you know, I, I saw this like the CNN like the scientist who was like was one of those like experts on CNN. And you know, she was showing a picture of like, you know, how she would look on TV, and it's like very nice and professional. It's artwork in the background, a nice shelf and everything. And then she showed a candid shot from the side and she's like in her living room, there's like toys on the floor and, and there's like, just like crap all over the place. But yeah. it's, and that's just kind of how we, how we've had to live the past, like in a couple of years. And, and I think there's something to that. I think there's something really positive to that in breaking down that barrier. And we get to see that people are people. Yeah. You know, we, prior, we, we had to explain to people what Zoom was. I never yeah. heard of Zoom until like six months into the pandemic. We've been using so. Zoom since 2018. Okay. Like early 2018. So uh, makes our job easier. I mean, j- just the idea of like, you know, breaking that barrier between like everybody needs to go to work mm. to like now if we can do all our work. We can avoid a two hour commute. You know, why don't we do that? Let's, let's improve. Let's, let's, 
you know, if we can keep quality of work going and improve our, our home life and spend more time with our kids and like not have to drive and like, you know, waste gas and, and, and rubber as much, why, yeah. why don't we? And not put on pants. Yeah, not put on pants. I mean, <laughs> it's it's funny because like <laughs> before the pandemic, you know, I used to do, I do a lot of conventions, I go on tours and everything. Sure. So I have like home clothes and then I have like touring clothes. Right. And now like, you know, three years into it, I don't have, all I have is like Under Armour, you know, have to <laughs> or or your 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 professional clothes are just tops. Oh no, my 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 professional clothes is like Lululemon, you know, <laughs> it's whatever. Like I don't, I I cannot imagine ever buying like a like a suit jacket or a tie ever again. Yeah, I'm going to a wedding. I'm just like screw it. I'm just gonna I'm gonna go in my Lululemons. I'm waiting for for fashion to change so much that it's like sweatpants on the bottom and like mm. a nice shirt on top. Are we already there? Well, for for some people, I mean, I, I'm the I, I'm wearing actually. I have some Under Armour uh, <laughs> pants on and and you know a plain tee, but there are times where I'm doing you know work with clients or something, and I'll put on a button up shirt. I'm not changing my pants. Oh yeah, absolutely. I'm not going to see. You know? Like every time I'm in a Zoom call, people are like, "Are you actually wearing pants?" I'm like, look, pants. <laughs> you know. In case you didn't believe it, you said that you've been writing from home for a while? Yes. So uh, I debuted in 2013. I technically went pro as an author in 2012, which is kind of like when I got my first book deal. Sure. And um, I think maybe like six months into uh, my uh, into uh, my debut, I just kind of you know thought, you know what? I'm going to go for it and we'll see what happens. I went full time writing. My, my wife at the time was like, I'm going to give you two years to make something of yourself. And after that, you're getting a job. What made you want to write? Because you must know that most writers never make not just enough money, but any money. Yes. that Publishing is not the most profitable field. No. <laughs> so did but, you think that you had a different, something different to contribute that would make success more likely? Or was there a, a passion around writing? A combination of, it's, it's a couple things. Um, I think, first of all, it's, you know, I wanted to be a writer since I was like in second grade. Okay. And like when I was 16, I was like, you know, dad, I'm, I'm going to be an English major just like you. And I'm going to write books for a living. And and, and, and he was <laughs> like, you know. <laughs> and, 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 so my father's an English professor. So he, he's, he knows what that track's like. And he was like, yeah no son your life will suffer so so i didn't i, I didn't become i wasn't really? an english major i was a computer science major i you know i worked in consulting afterwards worked in large financial institutions and i was just generally kind of miserable so like um so it took me a long time to kind of figure out what, what i wanted to do and you know i had to i actually had to retire from martial arts to to write because when I was training, uh, I'm one of those like, you've got all or nothing kind of guys. Yeah. So at, at the height of my training, I was training like 18, 20 hours a week. You know, wow. on average, three hours a day, you know, six days a week. And at one point, you know, I'm like in my late 20s. I'm, I'm really good at shooting up at Bagua, Shini, and Tai Chi. But I was like, man, I don't have any friends. I, I don't hate my job, but what am I doing? And then mm. it was kind of back then when I was like, okay. I've always wanted to be a writer. Um, you've written some like, you know, stuff when you were a kid and you were pretty good at it. You enjoyed it. So let's give it a shot. And I started giving it a shot. And then like six months in into it, I was like, you know what? You, ca you cannot do both well. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a martial arts, you know, lesson I used to have is like, you know, if, if you try to fight in five different, five different styles, you're going to do all five very poorly. Mm. And, and for me is I can maintain a very high level of martial arts that requires so much time, so much effort, so much like dedication into all these aspects, or I can give this writing thing a shot if I really want to do it. And six, six months into it, I realized that, yeah, you know, I, I want to give this a real shot. And in order to quote unquote, you know, put in the time and effort and work into it to, to go pro, mm. I, something had to give. And in, in my case, um, it, it became my own martial arts. It's it's the uh, uh, the notion of burning the ships. Yeah, 
let's just cast aside yeah. everything else. Let's hundred percent focus on this as, as much as possible. So I'm, I'm curious, you know, you put, you put martial arts down. Were there other things that you put down? Did you, did you set up your relationship with your wife to be different? I mean, so at the time, um, let's see, I was a, I was a member of the Screen Actors Guild. So I actually had a relatively decent um, commercial acting career in Chicago. Um, and, you know, I, I was training, training Bagua and, and Chen Sao Tai Chi those, those 20 hours a week. You know, at the time I was also, we didn't have any kids. So it was mm -hmm. a little bit easier for me to like, just to be gone for like, you know, hour, like the entire day, entire weekend. Yeah. But um, yeah, you know, it's like once I made that, that change where I go, okay, this is what I want to be excellent at. This is the one thing that, you know, when, when I go, when, when, when I die one day, this, I want to say, okay, I, I gave this lifelong dream, everything I had. And to do that, I gave up martial arts and I gave up acting and mm. I just kind of said, okay, let's do it. And this is what happens. How'd you get into acting? On accident. Okay. <laughs> so I was, let's see, well, how, how'd that go? Um, I was training at uh, one of my, one of my, so uh, Earlier on, I was training at a, at a, uh, at a kung fu school, and um, this uh, independent filmmaker came in looking for basically stuntmen and extras. You know, it was, it was, a, it was, a, low, it was a low budget film, and initially, I was recruited to just kind of like be like, I don't know, gangbanger number three or something. one of those guys who like run, run, run. You know, throw a couple punches and like you know learn how to take a take a punch and like and go down, and. I guess I did well enough and I had a good enough look to the director that he put me in a, in a, in a speaking role, hmm. you know, without, and the thing, the great thing about film is that no matter how bad of an actor you are, you can always just cut, like cut and re cut and reshoot. Yes. So, so after you I only have to that, be good once. Yeah. You have to be good once. And usually if you're doing like 10 takes, you have at least one good take, no matter how bad you are. So eventually I, I was kind of like, okay, this is kind of cool, you know, and Chicago is a very, very, um, it's an easier entry point for acting than most other cities. Like go to LA, it's brutal, you know, but Chicago is a great commercial town. Um, and to be honest, I was like a token Asian guy for like a bunch of commercials and it, it worked for me and that's how I got into it. So, and eventually I, you know, it became a, like a legitimate side hustle for me uh, until I realized that. You know, I, I actually really didn't love acting that much. I love martial arts way more than acting. And then I wanted to be a writer more than I wanted, you know, both acting or martial arts. So I just kind of like prioritized. Was there ever, was there ever the thought, okay, what if, what if I can move kind of up? If you're doing well enough in acting, can you, can you move up? Can you get some martial arts roles? Was that, that, that in and of itself wasn't appealing enough? To, to to take the momentum you had and and, and before before you answer because that question sounds judgmental and i don't mean it in a judgmental way i'm asking because i suspect that there are a lot of people listening going you you, you already had your sag card and you're acting and you're getting gigs and you're doing martial arts and you're good and you you in your words token asian which based on what we've heard from past guests should carve out a niche for you and you didn't want it. Yeah, I didn't want it. I mean, it it, <clears throat> it, was, it was a tough choice. I mean, it was like um, at the time I, I was my no, I, I was my sifu like no, I was I was a, I was just a protege. You know, I was like mm -hmm. his number one student. Um, I was working regularly as an as an actor. You know, I you know, I did book a few like small movie roles, and I had mm -hmm. some TV stuff. But I think at the end of the day, you know, it's just. I took a step back and I kind of thought to myself, well, why am I doing this? And at the end of the day, I just didn't love it. I mm. didn't love acting. I didn't love the craft. Um, at one point, I considered making the move to LA and I just realized that it was not like I hated auditioning. I hated mm. the process. You know? And so it's kind of like, as, as cool as it was, what did I want to do? What makes me happy? What makes me feel like I've accomplished something? What makes yeah. me feel like, you know, this is something I can do for the rest of my life? And, and acting wasn't it. Hmm. That's tremendously insightful for someone who was, I think you said, late 20s? Yeah, was my late 20s, yeah. And especially with a, a potential career path that so many people fall all over themselves for, sacrifice everything 
to not even get to where you were. That's that's powerful. It's a that's a powerful realization. Did you talk to people about this? I did. Um, so I mean, here's the thing: is like th- there is a difference between wanting to be something and the process and journey of doing it. Mm. You know, it's like, like I wanted to be I wanted to be an actor, and I you know obviously it's cool, and you wanted to be famous, and you want to like see yourself on TV. But if you've ever done like commercial commercial work industrial work you know like tv shows and stuff it it is a drag to be honest it's it's a drag it was a drag for me so it was a drag for me there's like when when you're doing you know tv tv is boring you're sitting around a lot it's you're you know you're going through the exact same scenes all the time and like if you're doing like commercial work literally that 30 second spot you're spending 10 hours shooting you know Mm. and if you're doing like god forbid if you're doing like something with food and you're just like chewing on food all day and you're spitting it out in the bucket. <laughs> it's, it's it's not fun. It really isn't fun. Um, I would say theater is a lot more fun than, than film mm-hmm. and television. And I, I think most actors would agree with that. But um, it's I had fun doing martial arts and I had fun as a writer. And, and acting just was, wasn't doing it for me. Okay. So when you started thinking about, okay, Writing is going to be it. Writing is going to be the thing I'm going to throw 100% into. And especially as you started thinking about, I'm going to have to put martial arts down. You must have started thinking about what it was you were going to write about and how you were going to write about it. Uh, You know, that's one of those things where like, there is something with like youthful, ignorant exuberance <laughs> early I love, on. I love the way you were putting this. Okay. <laughs> early on, I was like, I am going to just go. I, I'm not going to think about it too much. I'm just going to write. And I, I mean, because of my background, you know, all of my books have a fair amount of martial arts in it. Mm-hmm. I, um, <laughs> um, the, my, my debut novel is called The Lives of Tao. And it's about a, it's about an overweight IT guy who gets possessed by an alien who is, you know, who's fighting like a, like a secret war between like two alien factions. And this alien, this guy named, this alien named Tao um, used to possess like other people throughout history. And he was like Genghis Khan and he was a guy who'd been in Tai Chi. And this, he, he was all these things that, that I know about and, and that I love. So it was a joy to kind of write that mm. um, because especially early in your career, you know, you, you draw upon things, you know, and things you love. And that just happens. So everything that I loved about, you know, martial arts and like, you know, samurai Sunday movies and like different styles and different kinds of weapons, you know, that, that I put that all in my book. Mm. So it, it, it was a, just a really fun process. And there's something to be said about writing it when you're inspired and there is no greater inspiration than when you're like, when you're like an aspiring writer and like, the, the, the potential was endless. I was less jaded back then. I should, you should say. Sure, sure. Uh, the other, the other thing I'm I'm trying to wrap my head around is, it sounds like you found success quickly. You said your wife gave you two years, so obviously it was less than that. I'm doing okay. <laughs> I'm doing I know. Okay. I, I'm not. I'm not going to ask you the specifics of where you applied your efforts that led to that success because inevitably that you know that that's your own privacy or if you choose to give us some of those elements that's fine i mean it goes to so like when i went full-time i think it was like actually january 2014 you know and i had my two-year limit and like and i'll be honest i i had a pretty good job you know before mm-hmm. i went full-time writing and i i just i hated it you know so did you was, quit it, i got laid off which is even oh, better. Convenient. Yeah, I know, right? Wow. Well, I, I severance I got, or just unemployment? Uh, both. Oh, <laughs> oh, like this well, is kismet. This it, is supposed to happen. It, 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 it was serendipitous. I mean, so like in that way, it did help me a lot because my, my wife was like, okay, you're not making zero money because I, I think I took like a 98% pay cut. <laughs> I had a pretty good job. So I took a 98% pay cut and like my wife was like, you're not doing this to me. I'm like, just, just, just sleep on it, you know? So we came to the arrangement of, I got two years to make something of myself, or if not, I need to go back and get a job in my, you know, at my previous industry. And mm-hmm. that 
was motivation right there. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think I wrote two books that year. And then I wrote two books the next year. So, like, within, like, that, you know, four, two-year time frame, I wrote, like, four books. And um, they were commercial. They were, they were enough commercial successes that after, you know, after the, the third book that got published, I, was, I began to kind of have confidence that, hey, maybe I have something here, you know. Mm. Obviously, there has to be some talent, but, you know, just like in martial arts, to be honest, I, I feel like talent is the least important aspect of success. For commercial success, I would agree, yeah. yeah. Or, or, or I'm just, I'm, I think um, even in training, um, I, one of my, you know, my, my Tai Chi teacher, he, he always said, you know, in a fight, um, talent is like 15% of the equation. Mm. And uh, what, what, what did he say? It's been a while since I said this quote. Like, talent was fifteen percent. Um, like hard work was like twenty five, and the rest is all aggression. <laughs> you know, he, okay. he, 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 who, he who is most aggressive. I mean, will usually win a fight. And I, I would say, if when you're doing like when you're doing like tournaments and sparring, I would probably disagree with that. But in like a street fight or in, in a fight where it's there's no rules and you know you don't know exactly you know what when there's no rules and it's kind of um not not like a setup fight which is kind of yeah, a, a, just a spontaneous fight sure. aggression will, will usually win the fight i was thinking about this the other day in the context of animals and people confrontation between animals and people and how an adult human being, a 200 pound man might run away from a 20 pound dog, Absolutely, right? If, yeah. if, if you look at the, the attributes, there's no reason the human being shouldn't win, but it's the ferocity yes. of the 20 pound dog. So that's exactly what you're talking about. I mean, a, a, aggression goes for a lot. And, um, and also it's like, and this is something that, that we talked about a lot when we were training is um, my, my master would used to show me like, like if you see a lion pounce, okay, a lion pounces with his entire body. You know, mm -hmm. integrated movement is is what you know is what animals do. Mm -hmm. um, and in order to commit your body to that, you have to have a sense of like assertive control and aggression. Mm -hmm. And uh, for most people who aren't from aren't used to fighting, who aren't used to you know, they like you can tell because when they're when they're standing there, you know, they're. It's, it's arm strength versus body strength. It's it's they're not they're not committing, and and that's part of aggression too. It's like being able to kind of like tune your body and, and commit into a move and or, or, or a fight. Sure. We've had a number of authors on the show, and and those authors who have spent time in martial arts tend to bring their mar. You already said you're bringing your martial arts into your stories. Was that easy for you? It was in many ways too easy. Uh, <laughs> and okay. here's why. Because uh, like the, the most important, probably the worst book I've ever published, but the most important book I ever published was my debut novel. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is because I kind of, that's where I learned to make all the mistakes. So I, so I remember in the early draft of, of, of my book, I would, you know, I love fight scenes. And I think most martial artists love. Absolutely. We can reenact fight scenes. We can break down fight scenes. We can watch, I can watch, you know, once upon a time in China and I'd be like, okay, even though he's fighting with a rope, th th those are rope dart movements and that, that's, that's, a, that's a bow staff. And I can kind of see how it works. So I love breaking down fight scenes. So when I wrote fight scenes, I, 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 it was like my bread and butter. I was like, I love, I'm, I'm just wallowing in joy, you know? Mm. And part of the problem is um, fighting the, the effective fight scenes depends on the medium. So I learned how to break down fight scenes from like from training and from like watching movies. But to properly write a fight scene, you need to kind of like reduce it even more. Um, yeah, I think I've when my, when my wife read like you know like those early fight scenes, she'd be like you know flipping through the pages after a while. She's like you know at this point you're just like mentally masturbating it out, you know, because detailed fight scenes in that in that way might work for choreography but it doesn't work on the page mm. you know it's it's not about the movement that matters it's about the emotion it's about it's about the 
the results of, of the actions. So when you spend too much time kind of work on, like waiting in the weeds for a, a, a fight scene on prose, you're going to lose the reader. And so it, it was one of those things where I had to like kind of fine tune myself is how do you, if I am known as a, a, an author who writes fight scenes, how do I write it in a way that best serves the reader, not what I have in my head? Okay. And so if, if we were to look at the fight scenes between your first book and a more recent book, side by side, what would we notice different? I would say that I did fix a lot of my, you know, my hangups in my debut novel. So it's not as bad as, as those early drafts that no one will ever see. Oh, okay. Um, but de- definitely my, my later fight scenes, um, they, they're, they're more multi-layered. So not only are they exciting and there's, there's you know, fights between, you know, but what, what, what is a fight? A fight is a conversation with fists. You know, we, we are, it, it is the last resort of diplomacy. So mm-hmm. every fight in a novel has to have purpose. You know, either we're trying to you know, convince, we'll win an argument, convince, an arg- convince one side that, you know, your side, your side is correct, or you're trying to get past this obstacle to get to a plot point. So... Now with my more recent fight, uh, my more recent scenes, action scenes, every scene has to have layers. So not only is it exciting and there's a fight scene, um, but it has to sort of purpose. It has to, it has to change how the the character's emotional arcs are, so that the the guy who goes into the fight cannot be the same guy who comes out of the fight. Mm. I don't I don't care if like mm. you have a broken arm. I don't care if like. You know, while you're fighting, you you um, some other aspect of of that fight has reminded you of other of other things in your life that are, that are important. I mean, it, it has to change you in a way so that when you come out of it, there has to be a payout, a payout for for the reader, and also a payout for the character. Mm. I, I'm start. I'm thinking like I'm thinking through fight scenes, especially ones that I like. Right in TV and movies well, and books. And, and that seems to hold, whether it I mean, could be an injury or, or just, you know, emotional distress. Yeah. Or I'll give you an example. Um, like what, have you seen the Transformers movies? Yeah. Tons of fight scenes. All yeah. fight scenes. Um, did any of them really move you? Uh, only one. Um, right. <laughs> the, 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 the one guy. the one with optimus right <laughs> but like and, and that's the thing is like you know i i don't like to put down other like properties but like you no know, sure certain, certain fight scenes where like it's chaotic it's exciting there's so much stuff going on but i'm watching it going eh, I, I you're not really invested care. yeah i'm not invested you know and when they come out of it you know yeah you might see some like burn marks on like you know on like bumblebee shoulders or something but the next fight scene he's going at it again yeah, you know, Without, what, there's no if there's no consequence, there's no value in exactly. Yeah, no, you you got to mm-hmm. come out of it a, a different person. Bumblebee, you know, has to come out of every fight like a little more worn down, a little more like or, or you know, closer to his closer to his goal or just something. So you got to give mm-hmm. me you got to give me a distance between where he was and where he's at now. Now this seems like something you've thought about a lot. Is this something that? that came after you started writing or was this something you were aware of because you're articulating it very succinctly and i've never i've never heard it like this before i think i was always more aware of um these sorts of details than probably most of the writers um Mm. and and part of it just because i've i've I've, I've trained in it you know i know after three rounds of a sparring match i'm dead on my feet Uh, um i i know that like if you know, you watch you you know you watch all these like these like D and D shows where like there's like the, 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 the fighter is like walking through the, doing a dungeon crawl. He's got he's got his like his broadsword in his hand. He's holding it, and I'm like, dude, have you held a broadsword for more than like ten minutes? <laughs> I've said I've yelled the same you thing. Know? What is the weapon dragging weight? that thing on the ground? What is the weapon weight? I mean, uh, and you know, if, if, and if you look at most actual weapons, they're not heavy. You know, like a, a sword like you. Almost most swords on this you're talking about those double the huge huge double handers are like under two pounds. You know, but yeah, even you're then, still putting it away in between. Exactly. Even then, even though the weapons are two pounds, you have achieved until you need it because nobody wants to be carrying that stuff. So I mean, there's just a lot of small details like that 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 matter. And um 
And until you actually swing a sword, until you carry a staff, you know, a long six foot staff in a small, in a small cramped dungeon, you don't, you're not going to know like how that feels, how, how, how encumbered you could be. Um, mm-hmm. I, I did Kilimanjaro in 2015 and, um, oh, cool. and there's, you know, and we, you know, you were, we're hiking all day, but when you camp at night, sometimes you're not camping on flat ground. You're often not, you're camping at like, you know, three, 4% inclines and you wake up the next day, like at one end of your tent because you, you know, slid or rolled, rolled around and, and that happens. And that's, that's what real life is like when you're camping out and, and like in some like mm. manicured lot. So, so as a writer, when you want to keep things realistic, you know, you, you have to keep pay attention to these small details um I, I i've seen too many scenes where like you know dudes don't ever reload their pistols <laughs> so they're just, they're just shooting and, they're, and i'm like at some, at some point you got to run out bro you know i don't i don't and, and any anyone who shoots watches those scenes in movies and they're like what one two okay i, I wasn't aware that that was a 426 <laughs> round magazine well pro writing tip you readers are generally pretty good about mistakes you make, you know, mm-hmm. things here and there. And like, if you don't get everything perfect, they'll, they'll be like, ah, I caught that, but you know, whatever, we'll, we'll move on. But there are two things that you can never get wrong in books. First one is guns. Okay. Mm-hmm. I made a mistake where like I, I, I make clip, clip and magazine interchangeable in my first book. I was just going to... I know. No, he's yeah. gonna, he, he called it a clip because there's... there's a, so to yeah. listeners, if, if, you're not, if you're not aware of gun culture, um, a magazine is the modern thing that holds ammunition. A clip is like the World War One era yeah. thing that okay. bullets were attached carbine, you know? to. Yeah. <laughs> and, and a lot of people use them interchangeably and there's a, there's a, a group of diehard gun nuts even today who get really bent out of shape if you misattribute. So absolutely. Yeah. So the first one is guns and the second one is horses. Um, If you get horse, horse stuff wrong, the horse people will come after you. Did you get something horse wise wrong? I mean, I wasn't too bad. Do you have a get on the wrong side? Well, that's just a terminology. Like, um, like, you know, if you're like, like if you're talking about like, you know, if you're putting them on a saddle, like you got, you got to actually know the steps because if you get it wrong, they'll come after you. You know, mm-hmm. if you're getting like type types of how horses trot, you know, dressage. There's there's so many variables, and I found that most people are forgiving on many many levels when it comes to horses and guns. You can't get it wrong mm-hmm. for some reason. <laughs> I, I I get it, and no horse people are very passionate. Firearms people are very passionate. I suspect that if you did not have the martial arts background you have and tried to do the things you're doing and got some things wrong, you would also find, because martial artists as a community, we we, we aren't always forgiving to each other. Sure. Yes. I mean, I, we, we do like I those, those things, but mm. we're, we're definitely a little bit more um, tolerant than most, mm. you know? And also, like I, I, most most books don't have overly extensive fight scenes. Um, for, for my first book, you know, That's one true. of my one of my moments of pride of like I can I can reenact everything I choreographed, which sounds good in my head, but was kind of it was a silly thing to be you know to care about that much mm-hmm. in, in my book because um, you just need enough of a fight scene to to you know to get your point across and to move mm-hmm. the plot along. Anything past that, you should probably just cut. Where do you take your fight scene inspiration from? If it's if it's not generally, well, I shouldn't say this, but I'm getting the sense that the fight scenes you write in books are probably not the way fight scenes in books are often done because most fight scenes in books are not for martial artists. Right. I've actually done a little bit of consulting on this years ago, you know, writers saying, well, what do you think about this? I'm like, ah, this would never happen. This isn't, this isn't how like the body works. Right. But it, you know, TV and movies, it's a lot easier for us to, to see, you know, how that industry, that side of the industry works. You were even part of it. Right. Well, I mean, I, I, I think it helps that, you know, I, I did 
dabble in several different styles. Mm-hmm. And it, you know, w- once you have enough of a foundational knowledge of, like for me, um, my, my view has always been um, at the end of the day, all martial arts styles end in the exact same place, you know? So, but it, it's interesting to see like how you get there, you know, how training, when you train a certain style, when you, when you train, you know, Krav Maga, you know, what, 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 what are their foundation? Like, like what, what, how do they gauge distance? How, you know, how, how do, how do they fight with beats? You know, they, they, they and then, or like if you, if you train in like Tai, you know, Tai Chi and fight Tai Chi, you know, what, what, what are your, what are your, um, what are your default stances? How do, how do you, you know, what, what is your movement? You know, Bagua always just left and right. Every, everything is always about when you fight, almost your first movement is to get out of that center line, move, move to like a 60 degree angle where, uh, where someone's, someone's defenses tend to be, you know, a little bit harder for them to kind of manage. Sure. So, so once I had that kind of information, um, I, I usually, don't start with that. You know, when I when I write a scene, I, I start with um, what are my characters trying to do, and then how do I make them interesting people? How do how how do I how do I make this scene dynamic? So so I used to be more like you know here are the eight following sequences of, of this fight. Now now I lead by what makes this fight the most interesting, and most of the time it's not the actual fighting it's everything surrounding it it's you know it's it's the emotional compass it's the you know it's it's the the thoughts that the person's going through or sometimes it's even something as easy as like you know when somebody's fighting what goes through their head most, most of it's muscle memory because you know because that's that's how that's how that's why we do forms you know 500 times right. but but a lot of it is like you know what, what is your focus on it's on the eyes it's on the feet you know if you know how, how how long is their guard? There's there's all these aspects that that can that a, a martial artist can kind of like you know kind of kind of spot while while they're fighting that kind of explains where they come from. Mm. So it kind of it influences their background. So I I, I do I do uh, basically it's character development through fighting. You know okay. because because you're using their point of view to kind of ascertain certain aspects of every every um every fight they can it you, you're explaining how they train what their background is and, th- and that's kind of like that's the layers that i'm talking about when you want to like have good fight scene is every fight should do m- multiple things mm-hmm. it should be just character development should, it should show what you know where they're at and where they're going to be at it should move the plot along it should do like it should do you know half a dozen things that kind of like after the reader comes out of it they understand so much more about the characters. Hmm. Have you written anything that makes you think, oh, I want to go train? Have you oh gotten yourself excited enough? No. You know, yes. I mean, look, I think, so what happened was near the end of my martial arts career, and I was training with this, um, with this, you know, in, internal master and, um, I I made I, I don't want to say it's a mistake, but I ma- I became a purist. Like mm-hmm. I loved training in this particular style, particular family. Um, I you know I love this flavor of Chen style Tai Chi, and you know after I kind of you know he actually passed away a few years ago, but like when I received like when I get that inkling, I wanted to Tai Chi again, you know, and I thought about that all the time, but then. I admit that I kind of became a snob about it when I was training with him. Like I was, I was all about the lineage and I was, and then when I came back, you know, when I moved to Los Angeles from Chicago, um, I looked at some Tai Chi schools and, you know, I, I was kind of like, it, it wasn't hitting me the exact same way, you know? So, so that, that was, that was half of it. Half of it was like, you know, I, I became a, a style purist, but another half was like, when you're in your twenties and you get, you get like punch in the head, you're like, "Hey, man, that's that's a good punch." But when you're in your late thirties and you get punched in the head, you're like, "That's a concussion." <laughs> you know? so, so at some point, it was. It, I I do want to train. I did want to train, but um, I just I was I didn't want to take, take take that many more hits. 
you know, and I, I had kids and I was getting old and my back hurt and, you know, and, you know, like we, we all have like kind of, kind of iffy knees at this point. Yep. Or at least I do. So yep. no, I, knees, knees are common. Knees are common, right. Knees are common. I'm still flexible though. So that's one thing I still kept, but that's everything good. else, you know, kind yeah. of around the wayside. Do you think you would have ended up writing without martial arts? Probably. I, Do you think I, you would I, have started writing sooner? So I started writing in second grade. And like, I wrote like a short story. And like, mm-hmm. you know, and my father, who's an English professor, was like, son, this doesn't suck. Which, which in like, you know, old country Asian parent thing is, you know, it's, it's a high compliment. So <laughs> I, I have heard this. Yeah. So I, I believe I would have still, I would have still been writing, but um, I do believe that I have a relatively unique voice in the field. Mm-hmm. And, you know, my, ba- and it, it's absolutely been influenced by my background. So would I have been as successful a writer? I'm, I don't know. I really can't answer that, but I like, I'd like to think that, you know, because martial arts was such an important part of my life, and it's such an important part of my books that um, it kind of helped kind of get my foot in the door with, you know, with this specific type of storytelling that I do. Do you think you'll ever train again? I would like to. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I hope so. It's please continue for, and, and then I'll add on. Well, you know, it's, 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 so I'm, I'm a different person than I used to be. So like, for example, um, like when I was younger, I used to love doing boxing. I still you know I boxing classes, you know, just boxing seminars. And I think I think boxing overall is a is a very effective and complementary training tool to you know to to every martial artist. But then um, I I picked it up during the pandemic, and I hated it. You know, and and part of it is maybe part of me is no longer enjoys the repetition that you know that boxing sometimes requires. You know going through the combinations and, and hitting the bags you know and and, and part of me just because i don't have the patience for new forms so i think it depends on what what i'm doing and um and i i do miss it on the regular so so it's, it's a mindset thing i think for me is one of these days I'll, i'm gonna have the right mindset i'm gonna find i'm gonna let, let go of my, my my bullshit like you know e- ego about my family styles or whatever and i'm just gonna go practice and i'm and i'm gonna catch it again and especially with softer more gentle styles on your like like yang, yang, yang style tai chi mm. i could do that when i'm 70. Mm-hmm. you know and i do remember like even though i never fought with yang style tai chi because it's actually very hard to fight yang style tai chi but um i remember having that sense of calm and, and, and feeling the feeling the the jing or like the you know the, the chi i should say like kind of go, go through your body yeah. um you know especially like you know it's like one of the things that the reason why you do tai chi very slowly is because you're trying to have that energy you know feel the energy through your body um when when people ask me about that like, what does that actually mean you um, know the example I, yeah. I often use is like swinging a baseball bat when you swing a baseball bat you don't swing through your arms you swing through your whole body you swing through your feet yeah. you know your, your body is loose and your body is like loose and supple until that form of intact when you're swinging the bat. And that's when you kind of like almost spear your feet with, with your, I'm sorry, spear, spear the ground with your feet mm-hmm. because that kinetic energy going from soft to hard. And so it's like, it's, it's very, it's things like that, that I really enjoy feeling. You know, I don't, I don't enjoy punching things anymore or like feeling the impact, but I do enjoy the, the feeling of like integrated movements and kind of, you know I mean? At the end of the day, Martial arts is a healthy exercise. You know, keeps you young, keeps you liberal, keeps you fresh. I'm glad this is your answer because as you were talking about it, you know, as, as you might imagine, I, I, I've had a few conversations. You know, we, we, we've recorded a few episodes here. And, and as, you're, as you're talking about, you know, that you would, you use the word quit. I haven't used the word quit for you because quit to me means something a little more final. But I didn't use that word, but I didn't hear final. Right. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad you haven't shut the door. I'm fairly confident at, at like, you know, at some point, I mean, 
that I'm, I'm going to go back to it. Um, it's been such an important part of my life for so long. And um, like, in the, to this day, you know, especially with my writing, it, it's, I'm always thinking about it. I'm always thinking like when I, like when I watch like, you know, like the UFC and watch MMA fights, I kind of, I know I understand what's going on. I might, you know, I, mm-hmm. I break things down. And I, and, and when I, like, when I go, okay, I just saw what he did there with that, with that spin kick. And that was actually really cool. So there's definitely still a love for it there. Mm-hmm. It's just, I think, Maybe when, maybe when my kids get a little older, I will start training with them. I think I would love to do it. Do that, mm-hmm. but right now my oldest is six, my youngest is three. But I can absolutely see like us going, you know, to a school. Maybe when my youngest is five, and we just kind of start doing it as a family because nice. you know it's martial arts is a, is a great family affair. Absolutely. Where can people find your books and and tell us more about the books? If you have series, you know, like. So, so, so help us know where and what to buy. So um, I'm best known for um, a book called The Lies of Tao, which is my debut novel. Um, mm-hmm. the, the, the Tao and Io books are two separate trilogies set in the same world. And that is um, that is out in, in any bookstore. Barnes & Nobles will have them. In any independent bookstore, they should have that those books. Um, but the new book that I'm most excited about is called The Art of Prophecy. It is uh, my epic fantasy debut. Um, okay. It's an Asian martial arts fantasy. And it's kind of like my love letter to like wuxia movies. Oh, okay. So like, like when I was, um, I, I moved from Taiwan to Nebraska when I was five years old. And like, you know, Nebraska back in the 80s, there were like five Asians, okay? And like four of them were in my family. I can't imagine two places on earth that are more opposite than Taiwan and Nebraska. You're only the third person from Nebraska that I'm aware of (laughs) having ever spoken to, by the way. I will say this. uh, Nebraska in the 80s was a great place to grow up. It really was, you know? I mean, it's like, it's like, you know, you watch like Stranger Things and they're like riding bikes to like cornfields and like you know, it's that was like how you how you grew. I grew up back then. I loved it. Um, you know, you like right right on dirt bike tracks and everything. But um, at one point, if you, you gotta get out of Nebraska at a certain age and see the world. Um, but for me, when when I was a five year old kid living in the '80s in Nebraska, you know, like we were like you know just poor immigrants and um. You know, we were. It was all about integrating. Like, like, like okay, we we are four immigrants. We want to kind of integrate with society here, and so well, those sam- those old samurai Sunday movies were like my mm. connection to my people. You know, to my history, to my to my to the old country. So, and as a five year old, you don't really know better. So I just kind of glommed onto it, and so you know, it really instilled like a lifelong love of like you know wushu, you know the wuxia stories, the whole the concepts of like brotherhood and, and like, you know, and honor. And so I, I just, I, I just loved it. And that was the type of book I wanted to write my entire life. Mm. And, and to be honest, it was, uh, I wasn't ready. I mean, I'm, I'm, I've published 12 books and I think it wasn't until I published 11 that I finally said, okay, this, the story has been sitting in my head for the past, like, you know, well, God knows how many years, but I, finally, after like, you know, I hit the times list and everything. And, you know, I've, I've done well for myself where I sat down and go, okay, I am now ready to write this book. Hmm. So yep. The art of prophecy is like, um, it's a retelling of the chosen one trope. Um, it has many kind of aspects of like wuxia movies, but it's told in a, in a Western style storytelling. Mm-hmm. So, um, so it's not quite like how like you know sometimes it's it's, it's not quite anime. It's not quite you know like, like the the Chinese way of storytelling is different than than the Western. Mm-hmm. Wow. So I definitely am more of a Western style, but I'm also using a lot of inspiration from you know from like romance of the three kingdoms from like you know the, the old fist of legend movies and what's upon oh. a time in china like some stuff from 36 chambers of shaolin um hero house of flying daggers so a lot of the classics now here's a, a last question before i turn it back over to you to close us out writers seem to be quite divided as to whether or not they ever want to see their books become movies where do you sit i think <laughs> Any writer who has the opportunity for an option that should sees it. Um, <laughs> and that's, that's kind of a no-brainer to me. I'm so, uh, all my, all my properties have been optioned. Okay. So, um, and, uh, the war art saga, which is the series that 
that, that's coming out, um, starting the Art of Prophecy, was actually optioned before I finished the book. Oh, cool. So that's been in development for a while, and it's actually nice. it's actually pretty far in development. Um, usually, I don't like to kind of like go into any more detail than that because the thing about Hollywood is that there an option is hard to get, but that's actually the easy part. The, the, you know, mm-hmm. once you get the option, um, you have to go to like a hundred no's, hundred hundred ways for this option to down the vine. Before you finally get the green light yeah. to actually have a you know a purchase price or or like a you know a, um, a pilot order, so yeah. So I mean, I would say any writer who has the option, who has the opportunity to get an option, should seize it. Um, when I was younger, my thing was just give me the option. I don't care what you do with it. Just give me. Let's just make a movie out of it. Just make a TV show. And and now as as I'm quote unquote, like a pro or a veteran at this, um, I turned down a lot more money to get to work with the people I want to work with. Oh, because right on. at the end of the day, it's like, you know, I, I can just go for a larger option price, whatever. But what gives my properties the best possible chance of success? Yeah. You know, like I turned down a very big movie deal to like to make to go to TV. And and part of that was because, you know, the, the odds of getting a TV show made are infinitely better than a movie. It's hard to make movies right now, you know. Mm-hmm. Also, the the showrunner that we had tabbed was um was, was the co uh, executive producer for Lucifer. Um, the director they had attached was, was uh, you know, she worked on The Wire. She did you know, Wheel of Time. She did like Altered Carbon. You know, like she did the show stuff. That, he did the show that I love to watch. Yeah, you know, and so and once you see um that the producer for for the War Art Saga, um, I mean his current hit is The Boys. Oh, and I'm like, look, this is the team I want to work with. I don't, yeah. you know, obviously I love money. Who doesn't love money? But like, what what's your priority at this point? Is you you want to you, you want to get it made, and you want to get it made with you know as much as your vision as possible. Because even though you're you're doc, you're adapting it to you know, there's a showrunner adapting it, which means he's the he's the main writer. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's not just your baby anymore. It's you know it's a, it's a group effort, but you still want your vision to come as as clear as possible through the screen. So you know that's that's what you do. I look forward to seeing seeing these things come up on screen in addition to in word <laughs> awesome man hopefully yeah yeah well this has been an awesome conversation and and this is your chance to close us out so what you know obviously it's a martial arts audience what do you want them to know hey guys keep on training you know it's it's i would say if you love martial arts and it's your life and it, it's a, it's a lifestyle, then um, definitely you, you, you treat it like it's part of your life. Um, I think one of my regrets is that like, um, when you love something enough and you make it part of your life where it is something that you do on a day in and day out and it makes you a better person and makes you a stronger person, um, find room for it, carve room for it. You know, and I did this with writing as well as um, when I was an aspiring writer, I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this as a professional, which means even though I'm not getting paid and I'm writing after hours, I'm writing in the middle of the night, whatever, um, it is important enough for me that I'm treating it like a job. So I must write at least two hours a day or whatever. And, and part of me wishes that I did the exact same thing with martial arts was even though I had to reduce it, you know, to make room for other things. If it's something you care about, it's something you love, and it's a part of your life, you gotta make room for it. So that's probably one of my regrets. What did you think? Good stuff, right? I wanna thank our guest, Wesley Chu, for coming on the show. I wanna thank you for listening and for the support that you've given to us over the years and hopefully for the continued support. Head on over to whistlecakemartialartsradio.com to see the full show notes. Yeah, your podcast player gives you some of it, doesn't give you all of it. You're going to find photos, videos, links, 
transcripts. So if you're ever looking to go back, what was that episode that this person said this or where in the episode? It's a fast way to find things. Frankly, we use it internally all the time. And if you want to support us, you've got a bunch of choices. Share an episode, leave a review, tell people, Patreon. You could have me come out to your school for a seminar. We are looking out about a year in advance right now. So if you want to get your school on the list, reach out to me. Easiest way, jeremy at whistlekick.com. If you have suggestions for guests or topics or feedback or anything like that, you can also email me at that same address. Our social media accounts, they're all at Whistlekick. That takes us to the end. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. 